Welcome to Story Collider. Yeah! <laughs> awesome. So there was a small park near my house when I was growing up. It had a playground, it had a baseball diamond, but if you wanted to find me and my buddy Nate, your best bet would actually be to look in the creek along the edge of the forest towards the end of the park. You'd find us wading in the water looking for special rocks, and these rocks were special to us because these rocks were full of fossils. Fossil shells in particular, and we could tell there was something weird about them because they looked sort of like the shells that you would see when you go to the beach, but there was something a little off about them. There was something just a little bit different. And as third graders, not members of Rock Club, but just amongst ourselves, we knew that this required further study. So we would collect the best rocks that were available to us on this expedition, and we would get ready to head home. And if we went to Nathan's house, we'd probably get distracted playing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Hyperstone Heist on his Sega Genesis. But <laughs> if we went to my house, where we didn't have any video games, we could use some of my fossil books to maybe identify these things that we would found. There are two problems with this approach. The first problem is that fossil books for kids tend to focus on the big charismatic stuff, things like dinosaurs and mammoths, and less on Ordovician brachiopods, which is what we'd actually collected. <laughs> and the second problem is a good number of the books I had had been written by creationists. So by the time, <laughs> yeah. So by the time I graduated from high school, everything I knew about evolution had come from the pulpit at church and not the lectern at school. And the funny thing is I think about these dinosaur books now and the ones that were the creationists from the church library, they actually kind of weren't bad. Like the way they explained going out into the field and getting fossils is pretty much how we go out in the field and get fossils. And the way they reconstructed the dinosaurs is pretty much how we think those dinosaurs looked at that time. And it was really only when you asked how old the dinosaur was or any other interpretive aspect of, of paleontology that they would go off the rails and start talking about literal dragons and generally sowing doubt into the integrity of the scientific method. I went to a series of evangelical churches growing up and each of them had pretty consistent views on the fact that evolution was bad and deceptive and evil and creationism was good and pure and true. And even given this narrative, I was never mad about the science. I was never upset at science. I still loved science. I was fascinated by the natural world. I'd just been only given one way to interpret the world around me. And the, the funny thing is I went to a public school and the public school really didn't have anything to say on the matter either. And I think about why that may have been. And I think there was a lot of certainty coming from the church. They, they knew for sure that they were right. And I think even my science teachers at the school were still part of that same sort of faith community in a small town and were maybe not wanting to pick the fight with the church by saying what was coming out of the pulpit on Sunday was wrong. And I don't necessarily blame them for that, but it just meant that they weren't saying anything. And when science is taught to kids, it's often taught as just this series of facts, these things that we know about the world. And it's not taught as a process or a way that we understand the world and learn new things. That usually doesn't come until later in college or even grad school. And so what I had on one hand was absolute certainty coming from the church and silence with an accessory list of facts coming from the school and no sense that anything was amiss. And I think about that certainty a lot because certainty can be really rigid. If you are certain about something, there's no room to modify it. And without that modification, your certainty can become very brittle. And when something is brittle and it has a stress or a force applied to it, it doesn't deform to accommodate that new stress or new information, it just breaks. And sometimes it breaks catastrophically and falls apart entirely. And by the time I graduated high school, I was starting to develop some cracks in the foundation of my belief based on this kind of brittle certitude. And the first one I really remember happening was when my dad and I decided to go to an after hours lecture by a creation scientist that was being hosted at the church. His talk focused on how we don't see change over time, which is a core tenet of evolution, and descent with modification doesn't create new lineages, and we don't see any transitional fossils in the fossil record, which is pretty typical stuff for a creationist lecture of this level. And during the Q&A portion, my dad had a question. My dad's a physician, and this was around the time that the uh, antibiotic-resistant bacteria crisis was really coming to the forefront in medicine. So his question was a hypothetical case study where he raised his hand and said, let's say I have a patient who has a bacterial infection, and I want to treat that infection using an antibiotic. Let's say amoxicillin is the most appropriate one. 
So I prescribe a course of antibiotics and I kill all the bacteria but one. One bacterium survives because it's resistant. And once that treatment is done, that bacteria is gonna start to reproduce. And bacteria reproduce by splitting in half. And each of the two new daughter cells is a clone of the parent cell that produced them. And so this new colony, this new infection of bacteria is all gonna be resistant to amoxicillin. And so if I've taken a population, applied a pressure, they've changed over a single generation into a population with a new trait, how does that jive with everything you've just said? I don't remember what the guy's answer was. It probably had something to do with the differences between micro and macro evolution, which is how creationists explain that we can have different breeds of dogs and horses, but how horses never become hippos. And this isn't the way that a person who studies evolution actually thinks about the topic, but that's probably the answer that he would have given. Instead of listening to the answer, I just remember being stunned by the fact that my dad, who's this devout believer, could completely wreck this guy's argument with one simple hypothetical, and he wasn't doing it to be mean-spirited. He had an honest question, and there wasn't a good answer. My dad and I never really discussed what had happened that evening. Our relationship at the time was strained in the way that a lot of relationships between fathers and sons get strained during adolescence. But it wasn't the only time I saw him undermine the church's doctrine, not through outright dissent, but through a carefully constructed and critical question that was just clever enough to completely undercut everything that they just said. And it taught me that I was allowed to use my natural curiosity to ask really pointed questions about the things I was being told to believe on faith alone. And so I graduated high school and I headed off from a religious conservative upbringing in West By God, Virginia to hippie liberal Santa Cruz, California. Go slugs. <laughs> I started off as a physics major because I'd had a good physics teacher in high school and I imagine that's how a lot of us picked our first major, whether we stuck with it or not. And by the end of my first year at Santa Cruz, I was getting pretty burnt out on physics and calculus courses, but I had some time in my schedule where I could take a for fun class, whatever I wanted to take. And I found out that there was a course called the Natural History and Evolution of Dinosaurs. And it was then that I realized that my enthusiasm over the D word overcame my fear of the E word. <laughs> The class was taught by Professor Hildy Schwartz, and it was in her class that I had the closest what I'll call road to Damascus moment in my conversion story. She was explaining the origin of dinosaurs in the Triassic and how they then evolved and diversified throughout the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. And she demonstrated this with a figure called a cladogram. And a cladogram is a special type of diagram that shows how organisms are related to one another based on traits that they have in common. And I was stunned. I was blown away by how complex, but ultimately how reasonable this explanation of dinosaurian diversity was. I'd been told my whole life that evolution claimed that things happened in these giant leaps and bounds, horns sprouting out of faces, hands turning into flippers, things like that. But here, I was seeing a much more subtle story. I was seeing how a, a shift in an ankle bone could change everything, or a new hole opening up in the skull might lead to a completely new lineage. And it took a lot of careful consideration. These People weren't just making assumptions and running off the cuff. They were really thinking about these things to order to put this all together correctly. It was like pieces of a puzzle that may make some sense on their own, but really it's only once you put them in the context of a larger whole can you really see the big picture. And it was then that I realized that this thing that I'd been told was going to lie to me my whole life, was going to try to deceive me, was instead really elegant and really clear and really open and really wanting to be understood. And it made a big impact on me to the point where my brittle belief really did start to break down. Um, I remember that was the moment where this fire had been lit because I realized that the things that we thought we knew could really be challenged because we had this system here that instead of being rigid and firm was actually flexible and wanted to be tested and that going out and finding a new fossil that might change the way you understand an organism isn't a bug but a feature. You want to actually go out and change everything you thought you might know by finding a new thing. And it was with that revelation that I realized I needed to reconsider everything that I knew too. So I was so passionate about this course for the rest of my time there that I even sat in the front row of lecture, which is kind of a big deal for someone like me. 
And later, I, after the class finished, I went up to Hildy and asked her if there were more classes I could take along this subject. And she didn't know my personal history. She didn't know why her class had been so profoundly revelatory for me. She just saw a really eager student who wanted to learn more. And she helped me get signed up for some advanced paleontology classes that were happening in the fall, even though I didn't necessarily have all the prerequisites I needed to take them in the first place. Not long after, I ended up working in a vertebrate paleontology lab on campus with another professor, and then I changed my major to ecology and evolutionary biology. The brittle beliefs from my childhood eventually did crumble and were replaced with a new understanding, one that was much better able to bob and weave with an ever-changing body of knowledge about the world. I now find myself a tireless advocate for how awesome evolution is, I don't know if you guys remember, but it was only a few years ago that we as a society were having a pretty heated debate about whether it was appropriate to teach children evolution in school or if we as students did teach the controversy. The world's sort of on fire right now, so that debate has been put a little bit on the back burner. <laughs> but it's still something I'm really passionate about because of my personal history with this whole subject. And as the saying goes, there's no one more zealous than a convert. Thank you. <laughs> 